In this video, we are going to look at the topic of hardware description languages and in particular the Verilog HDL, which we would be using in this course. So the outline of this talk, first we'll motivate the need for hardware description languages and explain how they are different from regular programming languages. We'll then get into some details on Verilog, in particular the different modeling types and one major aspect of HDLs, which I need to emphasize and will be continuing to emphasize throughout the course is the distinction between simulation and synthesis. What do those mean and why we should keep that in mind as we write our very log code is something very important. So what's the need for a hardware description language? After all, we are trying to design some kind of digital systems. And as we know, there are digital systems that can be built using the Boolean equations and eventually can be implemented in terms of schematics. Now schematics tend to be hard to draw when we go down all the way to the gate level. At a high level, perhaps you might want to use schematics, but when you need to do that all the way down to individual gates and transistors, it can re it become really complex to handle. Truth tables are big and verbose. They essentially grow exponentially in the number of inputs that you are considering. And in general, is not a very compact or a reasonable way to represent the functionality that you want to implement in a digital circuit. Equations are good to explain what you are trying to do, but on the other hand are harder to represent and automatically reason about in the context of a computer. So ultimately what it boils down to is that we need a more computer friendly representation of the circuit that we are trying to build. And what's the best way to communicate with a computer? That's what programming languages are for. So we would like to have some kind of a programming language that is capable of describing hardware. Now, we need to keep this word in mind, description. The hardware description language is something that we are bringing into the picture in order to describe the kind of behavior that we want in such a way that a computer can understand it and do something with it. Now, the first thing to understand is what are the shortcomings of normal programming languages? We already have so many programming languages. Why do we need something new to describe hardware? Most programming languages, MATLAB, C, Python, any other thing that you would be familiar with, are based around a particular model of computation. In particular, that model typically assumes that you have unrestricted amount of access to memory. Of course, there are practical uh, exceptions to this, but at the base level, the language by itself does not impose memory as a sort of something that you need to be concerned about all the time. The other thing that happens is all the analysis of programming languages is still built around this idea of an elementary operations where you can sort of say that, you know, multiplication, addition, all of those are core functionality that are just readily available. And ultimately what we end up doing is having a series of function calls and system calls to various other library subroutines that can execute the functionality that we want. In particular, one of the things that is missing over here is this notion of time or a clock that synchronizes different parts of the functioning together. And also this notion of concurrency, which basically says that you could have multiple parts of the program functioning at the same time. Now, of course, threaded programs or concurrent programs or coroutines, goroutines, all the different kinds of variants of those do bring in this notion of concurrency and over there you also do have some kind of a notion of a clock or at least the fact that there are synchronization barriers which say that when certain different parts of the uh, program need to come together, synchronize and then move forward. They don't form a natural way by which you can model hardware. Now, one of the things to keep in mind over here as far as HDLs are concerned is HDLs explicitly bring in this notion of time or a clock and also of concurrency. But whether or not they actually correspond to hardware and whether they can be synthesized to a set of gates is not guaranteed by the definition of the language itself. Examples of hardware description languages are many, right? The Verilog is the one that we will be using in this course. On the other hand, VHDL is also very common, especially for defense applications. And it has a number of sort of specific use cases because certain styles of documentation and so on are 
much cleaner in VHDL. System C was an attempt to bring in a sort of variant of C that had this notion of time and concurrency and could use a sort of familiar programming language in order to implement something new, or in other words, describe hardware. Blue spec, chisel, and so on are new, relatively new types of hardware description languages that build on a lot of progress in programming language theory. In particular, these are functional programming languages. And one of the things that we can sort of observe over here is the fact that hardware by itself can be thought of very nicely in terms of functional programs, right? Things which take inputs and transform them into certain kinds of outputs. Every module in hardware can be thought of as a function, something that takes inputs, does something with it and generates outputs. There are several other custom languages as well, each with their own proponents, each with their own shortcomings. As far as we are concerned, we are going to pick very long and stick with it because it's common and sufficient for our purposes. So what are the things that you need to know as far as Verilog is concerned? The core concept in Verilog is that of a module. And a module, you can think of it as a chip on a breadboard. This is actually a pretty good analogy. It's better than it sounds at first because you literally need to think of modules as things like you know putting chips on a breadboard. And the reason for that is because when you have multiple modules instantiated inside a larger module, all those modules are effectively operational or functioning at the same time. This is exactly like chips on a breadboard. The moment you apply power to all of them, they are all active. They don't sort of work in sequence. It's not like one is waiting for another before doing something. You might be able to explicitly sort of cause one to stall until it gets input from another. But as far as functionality is concerned, even the one that is stalled is still wor working. It is waiting for input from somewhere else. Right? It's not like a function call in C where it does not even exist in memory until it actually gets called. What about the inputs and outputs, the ports of a module? Once again, the analogy with chips still holds. These are essentially the pins of a chip. There are a few more sort of specific language constructs in Verilog that you'll come across repeatedly. And it's worth sort of you know, briefly mentioning a few of them. In particular, one of the things that a lot of people have confusion about is this notion of a rig. Now, a reg in Verilog is something which people normally think it translates into a register. It means there's a register, but that's not really what Verilog says. What Verilog says is a variable declared as a reg is capable of holding a value and it can be assigned a value inside a procedural block inside the language. Now, why does this not correspond to a register in actual hardware? because of the way Verilog actually takes the code that you have written and converts it into hardware. It might even happen that code that you have written using a reg block actually gets translated completely into combinational logic without any registers at all in it. So please keep that in mind. Just declaring something as a reg does not mean that it's a register on the chip. It might translate into that depending on whether it is updated on a clock edge or you know a few other sort of constraints on that. But this is not something that's necessary. There is the always keyword, which essentially is the core procedural statement. This is the main part where Verilog brings in this concept of behavioral description. The fact that I can describe the behavior of a, of a piece of hardware without having to break it down into individual circuit elements and allows us to build complex logic. So in that sense, the always block is a very important part of the language. In addition to that, of course, you have the assign statement, which is pretty much the equivalent of just writing equations, Boolean equations. It's continuous assignment, easy to understand, and just allows us to implement simple functionality in terms of direct combinational assignment of logic. The key concept, of course, just to reiterate, is that you should stop thinking of modules or always blocks in Verilog as function calls. A much better analogy is to think of every module or in fact even every always block or even an assignment statement as either a wire or a module or a chip on a breadboard. Right? So there is some direct functionality which is implemented and each of these blocks, assigned statements, always blocks, modules are interacting concurrently with each other. So what are the uses of hardware description languages? 
the primary use, and this is why the HDLs were created in the first place, was for simulation. Right? And this is something important to keep in mind. Simulation is always possible. You can write various kinds of Verilog, which will simulate, but it may include non-synthesizable constructs such as file IO, weight statements, and so on. But there is absolutely no guarantee that just because you wrote something in Verilog and it passes simulation, it will work on hardware or it will translate into a piece of hardware. Synthesis is usually restricted to a subset of the simulatable constructs. And the most important thing that you should keep in mind is that whenever you are writing code that you want to be able to synthesize, you should be able to explain it in terms of a schematic, in terms of blocks, a block diagram, saying these are the different components, this is how they interact, and this is why it should actually get translated, or this is how it should get translated into hardware. Unless you can give that corresponding mapping, there is a good chance that the code that you wrote may not actually synthesize, or if it does, it might synthesize into something that behaves differently from what you simulated. Let's take a few examples of how first we can do combinational modeling using Verilog. The, there are usually three kinds of modeling, right? One of them is called the continuous assignment or the data flow model, which is almost like just taking the Boolean equation and writing it out and saying that, you know, you're literally going to take gates, connect them together, and you finally have a wire corresponding to the output. Very simple, easy to understand, but also applicable mostly for relatively simple kinds of logic computations. Structural is directly thinking in terms of gates. Right? You are literally putting in instances of different kinds of gates and gates or gates and connecting all of them up together in order to get the functionality that you want. So this literally says that the first AND gate takes in two inputs A and B and generates an output T1. The first OR gate takes in T1 and T2 as inputs and generates T4 as an output and so on. Right? So everything has been reduced to two input AND and OR gates which you have to explicitly design. So Verilog at this point is doing almost nothing for you. The highest level of description that you have in Verilog is something called behavioral description. Over here, you use an always block. You give it something called the sensitivity list, A or B or CI, in this case is the sensitivity list. It says that this always block is sensitive to changes in any of these values. If any of them change, you need to re-evaluate what happens inside the block. The nice thing is whatever happens inside the block is guaranteed to be evaluated in sequence during simulation, right? So the functionality is as given by the order of statements inside the behavioral block during simulation. But the good thing is in general, compilers are capable of taking this and then sort of breaking it up into a sequence of combinational logic gates that can then be implemented, provided of course you have written your always block in a manner that is actually synthesizable. There are exceptions, there are quite relatively easy ways by which you can create non-synthesizable constructs. So please watch out for those as you go forward. What about sequential elements? The most common one is the D flip-flop. And the simplest way by which you can model a D flip-flop is using the keyword pos edge. There is similarly also one called neg edge one important thing to keep in mind over there is don't mix the two. Don't use both posage and negage inside the same design unless you absolutely know what you're doing, right? Every rule has an exception. You can use posage and negage inside a design, but only when you can accurately explain exactly why you need it and what exactly it's going to do. In general, mixing posage and negage inside a single design is only going to lead to trouble. What does this description do? It says that at, at every passage of the clock, if the CE signal is equal to one, that is the chip is enabled, the output Q will take the value T. And this symbol here, the less than equal to sign, is something called a non-blocking assignment. And it's one of those interesting things that comes in Verilog, which allows you to model concurrent behavior. What it says is that the Q less than or equal to D, the Q will take the value of D but only at the end of the processing of everything that is happening inside this always block. Meaning that I can have two different statements, Q less than or equal to D and D less than or equal to something else. And Q will take the old value of D, D will now take on a new value of something else without sort of propagating one into the other. This non-blocking assignment 
the simple rule of thumb is whenever you want to implement sequential logic, you should be using non-blocking assignments. What about latches? Yes, it is also possible to write code that will get inferred as a latch, but in general, this is strongly discouraged. Right? So if you find that when you synthesize your code or the code that you're writing is such that you end up getting a latch instead of an inch triggered flip-flop, you should go and look at it again and probably try and get rid of it for multiple reasons. One is that it may not really match what you expected to start with. And the second is that in FPGAs at least, the latch based design is not really the recommended style of design at all. Right? And uh, they don't implement as well as edge triggered flip flops. Like I said, there are two concepts. One is blocking assignments and the other is non blocking assignments in Verilog. Blocking assignments are typically found inside always blocks and are used to describe combinational logic. They are good for procedural updates of variables that you introduce inside a block and to model complicated behavior, possibly you know, the next state computation of a state machine or the output computation of a state machine could be a sequence of small equations that all get written inside a always block using blocking assignments. Non-blocking assignments are meant to model concurrent behavior. There is no equivalent in a language like C. And essentially what they do is they model the update of a flip-flop output while the input could be changing. In other words, any behavior that says something like something needs to change at a clock edge while something else is happening to the input is modeled well using non-blocking assignments. Now it's possible to mix and match. In other words, you could use non-blocking assignments where you wanted to do combinational logic. And in some cases, you might even get away by using blocking assignments when you want to do a flip-flop update. But in general, the synthesizability will suffer. You need to keep one thing in mind. The synthesis tool is ultimately looking for patterns in your code. It doesn't really understand what you're trying to do. It just looks for patterns that match with known behaviors and says that if it matches this, it's going to make a flip-flop. If it matches this, it's going to make a multiplexer. If it matches this, it's going to make an adder and so on, right? So any coding style that you use that does not match with those patterns, it will try and infer something else. There's a good chance that it will get it wrong. So to summarize, hardware description languages model behavior. They do not in particular guarantee that the hardware that you have just modeled can actually be built. There is usually something called a synthesizable subset of the language that can be used to model hardware. And as long as you stick to the synthesizable subset and follow good coding style, and there are usually guidelines given by each uh, the vendor specific tools, which tell you how to write certain kinds of code. As long as you follow those coding styles, you should be able to get something that will actually synthesize. But the most important, the key point over here is always have the final schematic that you want in mind before you start writing your code and try to build that using Verilog rather than writing Verilog and looking at what kind of schematic it generates.